Okay, Dr. Ken, I think you should start this, this session with this wonderful quote that you have on here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, JP. Appreciate the intro. And again, I want to welcome, as JP did, all of you spending part, at least part of your evening with us for this most, most important information uh, relative to helping to make it safer for teachers and students in laboratories. Um, much, much of a need is there. And the first thing I want to say is you cannot make science in STEAM learning safe. What did he say? You can't make it safe, then why are we doing all this? Accidents can still happen. The good news, you can only make STEAM learning safer, all right? Please never tell administrators, students, parents, et cetera, that you are gonna make it safe. You just can't do that, but you can make it safer. Very important. Now, let's take a look here at the image. And by the way, all these images, nothing is staged on these images. They're the real deal, right? This young lady uh, is dealing, she's got her gloves on. You can see in the upper left-hand side there, <clears throat> dealing with some chemical in a beaker. She's got her indirectly vented chemical splash goggles. Uh-oh. -uh. Look at the hair, all right? The hair is hanging. Now that could get into the chemical. Uh, she's dealing with a burner. She can go up like a torch. I want to make sure again, always the hair is pulled back. That's one reason I keep mine short, so I don't want to have any of those problems. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Okay, to complete the initial secondary and tertiary safety assessments of these planned laboratory activities, educators need to know what to look for so that potential hazards, right, potential safety hazards we're thinking about here, and resulting health and safety risks affecting potentially dangerous situations can be evaluated from an informed, educated perspective. We're not just guessing. There is a means to do this in a logical, safer way. Absolutely. And I got to say, the author of that quote, <laughs> kudos to him. That was a great one. They let anybody in. Yeah, uh, they sure anyway, do. <laughs> hazards and risk. All right. Are you aware of what to look for when students or staff members bring you an outline of their inquiry based activity? which you should be asking for, by the way. You just don't assign something and then go ahead and do it, kids. No, always check first. You need to evaluate the educational value of the activity or items used against the potential safety hazards and resulting safety risks associated with it. In other words, safety, educational value. You wanna make sure they're in balance. Looking at the procedures and suggested materials, equipment, possible chemicals, or biological specimens, there are a handful of red flag items or processes that you should recognize and prevent students from continuing onward in their planned pursuit of knowledge. Let's look at how to recognize potential hazards and resulting risks in your school. Now, one thing I want to say before he flips this slide real quick, I hope this is not representative of your chemical storage area in these photos, this photo here on the right. This is just, and I'm not gonna say I haven't seen this, I do mock OSHA inspections. When I go into schools, I find these things, believe me. I mean, you've got some labels you can't read. You've got this gook oozing, look at all the residue, particulate sitting all over the place. Bad, bad, bad. Remember, not all chemicals get along and when they get together, Potential baboom. Okay. Items that STEM programs should not have on hand. Should not have on hand. These items have a greater inert risk than the educational utility or value. All right, aerosol candles products, acetone-based solutions, alcohol fuel burners. Please, if you have alcohol burners, get rid of them. I cannot tell you, I do expert witness work, how many of these involve alcohol fuel burners. The accidents are unbelievable and they're still out there, all right? They happen. 
alcohol is flammable. It's also toxins and poison, but right, you get explosions, et cetera, et cetera. Don't use them. And please, bacteria, don't send your kids around the school to take samples and then culture them and look at them. So, you ever heard of just one example, MRSA? <laughs> I mean, come on, are you kidding me? Body fluids, no, we're done doing urinalysis, all right? We're done doing blood, we're done doing sputum, saliva, et cetera. Chemicals on a ban list. Now, unfortunately, there's not one major ban list, but your Board of Education may have one or your Department of Health, local or state, or your Department of Education, right? Uh, American Chemical Society, National Science Teaching Association, right? They all have them. Common sensitivities in known allergens, concentrated acids and bases, formalin, formalin, excuse me, formaldehyde, we're also done with it. Formalin contains some formaldehyde, please, no. Glues adhesives would follow organic compounds, mercury, no, please. I still find mercury thermometers, barometers, et cetera, et cetera, no. Methanol. Now, sometimes you need to use alcohols, granted, but please don't use methanol. Unfortunately, with methanol, the flame can't be seen. And that's where the problems start. And you hear about all these kids and teachers whose faces, they're not burned, the skin is melted. It is so hot, all right? Um, just unbelievable. Poisonous plants. Kids, this is poison ivy. I keep the plant over here in the corner in my lab. No, 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 show them the photos, all right? Solvents, all types, unidentified chemicals. Oh yeah, unidentified chemicals. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Uh, specimens in formaldehyde? No, I don't think so. And you can see, and I'm sure there may be a few others, but these are the major players here that should not be representative in your lab. Next. <clears throat> okay, identify potential hazards in STEAM programs, all right? And remember STEAM, this also is for science, it's for tech ed, art, not so much math, but even though sometimes there are a few things in math that I find. Be able to identify possible risks in STEAM programs can often be achieved by a combination of appropriate safety training and awareness, knowing what to look for, raising your level of awareness, knowing what to look for, but also looking for it by following the proper procedures and safer, there's that word, safer with the R, operating procedures in the lab, as well as recognizing possible sources of hazards, you can prevent, let me repeat that, prevent the majority of possible accidents. They, most of them are preventable, all right? If you're uncertain, always ask. Always perform a hazard analysis, risk assessment, take the appropriate safety action prior. In other words, you do this before, all right? any planned lab activity and also demonstration. Next. Okay, we have something called the AAA approach. I like to say it's driving home safety, AAA. Okay, well, anyways, the method requires <laughs> teachers to, per to perform First thing you do, a hazard analysis. You analyze what the potential hazards might be for this acti hands-on activity or the demonstration. Before, again, each lab demonstration, as mandated by standard 45, the NFPA, then, then, then you conduct a risk assessment. Those, what's the resultant risk that can happen if, there are these hazards. And once you determine the risks and you know the hazards, what is the best possible safety action you can take to prevent any accidents? In order to perform this three-step approach to understanding and evaluating potential hazards, you must follow these steps sequentially. Very important. <clears throat> Triple A, again, hazard analysis. Now, what kind of hazards are there in STEAM labs, science labs, tech ed engineering labs, et cetera, et cetera? Three types, basically. There are physical hazards. A slinky, believe it or not, is considered a physical hazard. You've got kids pulling it one end to the other in a physics class in a, in a corridor. 
One kid lets go, that thing goes rolling, smashing right into the face, hits the kid in the eye. Oh, that's a physical hazard. There you go. Launching rockets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even a meter stick, just using kids using meter sticks. Now, I'm not talking small rulers, all right? That is small ruler. When you're dealing with a ruler, you're dealing with a lever. Ah, here's my lever system, all right? Here's my hand. Very easy to manipulate. When I'm dealing with a meter stick, it's just about three times this length, all right? Much more difficult to determine where that other end is going to be. So that's why we're saying here, you need to have high protection. Chemical hazards, we're all familiar with chemical hazards, acids, bases, flammables, toxins, et cetera, et cetera. Biological, all right? When you're dealing with the biological, you're dealing with primarily microbes, but even the big boy and girl plants, as we said, the poisonous ones can be a hazard right? Uh, SDS, that's primarily with chemical sort, and in tandem with teacher experience, safety notes from lab activity, use of a chemical hygiene plan, and trusted safety authorities. Now, trusted safety authorities might be another colleague, right? One who's been in the game for 30, 35 years and is a real safety advocate, right? Uh, it might be your health person, head of the health department in town. It might be your fire marshal, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, risk assessment, use of SDS sections specifically, and these are the ones that we note uh, in order to help you out with risk to determine what the risks are, resulting risks that highlight information for the safer handling, such as hazards, fire safety, accidental spill information, stability, toxicological information, and there's others. But that's how you determine the potential health and safety risks based on the hazard analysis. Moving forward, step three is the safety action. Determine the appropriate action based on the types of potential safety hazards and resulting as we've already said this. The top three actions considered based on OSHA's hazard prevention and control guide, including engineering controls, right? Engineering control, what's an engineering control? All right, so technology that helps protect you in the lab, like, oh, ventilation, all right? Eye wash, shower, control, electrical controls, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, administrative controls, okay, protocols that they've adopted, and also certainly personal protective equipment, safety glasses with side shields. Um, sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you must have indirect adrenaline splash goggles, okay, um, as well as look at those two words substitution elimination. Sometimes it's not worth doing it. You just can't make it safer. You go through that three-step process, driving home safety, it's still hazardous, still risk. You don't do it. Next. Dr. Ken, before I go on, someone has anonymously sent uh, two questions. I'll do their second question right now because it fits perfectly. And it's this, <laughs> Do Dr. Ken, what should you do if you see a colleague doing a dangerous activity? Stop them in their tracks. <laughs> um, very politely pull them out away from the students so the students can't hear them and tell them that you do, you saw what they're doing, you do have a concern and stress what the concern is. And your major concern is certainly is the safety of that teacher, the colleague and the students, most certainly. And things that can lead, things go south, they can lead to litigation, somebody getting hurt, going to the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. You do really do have a professional responsibility to say it. you should not ignore it because if something happens and somebody saw you looking in there, trust me, you will be pulled in court and you're gonna have a legal issue also. You're the one who supposedly is trained also and not that you're the supervisor, but when it comes to safety, you do have a responsibility. If you see something that is not right and you know it's not right, you need to intercede with that. Hopefully that answers the question. I think that was a great answer. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that, that's only me though. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> All right, six intentional safer practices for STEAM. The following six intentional practices will assist you in being able to evaluate the potential safety hazards and resulting health and safety risks when planning and with activity selection. 
Having a robust informed safety perspective will make the laboratory safer. And remember, not only for your students, but also safer for you and any other employees, paras that are in there. Thanks, next. <laughs> okay, the big six. Number one, review SDS for safety concerns. Identify, and please, any chemical you have, OSHA states that your employer is required to have a safety data sheet available for you. Again, let me repeat that. Every chemical that you purchase, all right, your employer is required to make sure you have the appropriate SDS. So you don't have it, tell them you need it. Identify any area of possible risk, including health, safety, storage, flammability, toxicity, and other pertinent items. Review all equipment, materials, apparatus, tools, machinery involved with the planned activity. You don't do that while they're doing the activity all along. You do it initially, but then you carry it over. All right. You don't wait until they start. You do it beforehand. That's the point I'm trying to make. All right. Review the procedures and material concentration, timing, sequence, waste management. Be very careful with waste, especially if you have more than one teacher, especially in chem labs, using the same lab. You want to make sure that the teachers are following using different con waste containers. Some of these products and reactants have issues with each other. So if the first teacher has it, the student put them in this waste container, the second class comes in, different teacher, not knowing what's in that waste container, puts the products into it, they react, they become the reactants, bad news, right? You can have fires and I've actually seen this happen. If you have not performed the activity before, test drive this experiment with a colleague and evaluate unexpected hazards results. The first time you're gonna do it, really important that you do the test drive first, all right? It's just like if you're going on a field trip, always make sure that you go to the site without the students first. Make sure, look for hazards, look for risks. What are the safety actions you need to take, all right? Then if you can do it in a safer way, then you bring the kids out. Don't just bring them out there and go, oh gee, I didn't know. No, that's not gonna cut it when you get sued. Allow for substitutions of hazardous chemicals for less harmful or making curricular expect, meeting curricular expectations. Ask if the educational value of doing the activity outweighs the risk. AAA approach, driving home safety. Okay, here's some examples, all right? The W.T. Woodson High School in Fairfax, Virginia, 2017. Five students seriously injured as a result of a teacher performing a dangerous chemistry experiment. Oh, gee, look, using open flames and our favorite alcohol, methanol. Wow, can't believe that could have happened, all right? Magnet School, K-12 institution in Hendersonville, Tennessee. The school was closed. They kind of closed the school after 12 students were actually burned in a chemical flash fire in the science lab, 2018. Should never have happened. San Diego, all right, Union District 2019, middle school. Third, look at this 13 year old, all right, had his face severely burned due to teacher recklessness. In fact, I hate to tell you this, friends out there, but most of my expert witness work, I find, because that's my job as expert witness, I find most of the teachers and administrators, they're not negligent, they're reckless. They knew, they knew what they were doing was unsafe, and yet they still allowed the kids to do it. All right, um, so just not go. And look, again, use of an alcohol. Now, again, don't think because you're using a different alcohol from methanol that you can't have injuries, you can. But methanol is extremely dangerous compared to most of the others. <clears throat> uh, the Cal County District, Georgia, 2019, high school student, 15, badly burned across his face and body in a fire in a science lab, all right? Look at this poor kid, unbelievable. You know what the sad part is? Those injuries are not gonna go away. Uh, the scars, when that kid gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, as old as that kid gets, he's gonna find those scars short of a face transplant. Okay. 
Methanol, oh, methanol accident in Virginia school. This one happened last year, 2022, at the high school in Virginia. Chemistry teacher, 15 years, 15 years of experience. I don't know what they were doing for the 15 years. I don't know what the experience was. But four students were burned when methanol ignited during a demonstration. You ready for this? No PPE or preventive measures were used by the teacher. Who on God's green acre has kids work with active flames and methanol without any, minimally, minimally, no eye protection? Give me a break. No gloves, no, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, unbelievable stuff. The activity was not known to the school administration. No potential safety hazard and, oh, geez, what a shock this is, huh? No potential safety hazard and now no resulting health and risk assessment prior to doing the activity? Come on, give me a Fledman break. So what are the most common sources of accidents? Uh, this in part was based on research I did at Penn State University with a colleague of mine, Dr. Ty Love. Um, one of the, the top ones, glue guns. And you tend to find this in STEM, STEAM labs, tech ed engineering. Um, rarely in science, science usually doesn't use too often glue guns, but these other areas most certainly uh, the most accidents. E accident, equipment and machinery, certainly across the spectrum. Power tools, um, spills and splashes. Well, it brings in your chemistry labs, there you go. Projectiles brings in your physics, general science labs. Um, and also some of these other areas. The re these report injuries that were handled at the school level and required no medical attention, right? So some of these do require shipping them in an ambulance, others do not, most certainly. Most common types of injuries, again, based on the study, cuts and lacerations, burns, trips and falls. I hate to say this, and I'm, I'm sure none, of the people in attending here are hoarders, but uh, science teachers tend to be hoarders. And the reason tend to be hoarders is because they never know when, how much money they're getting next year. And when they get more than they need, they just buy, 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 and they store it. Well, after a while, they get storing and storing, especially if they're there for 30, 35, 40 years, storing, 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 there's nowhere to move, right? And you get all these trip fall hazards. All right, or book bags, books on the floor in a lab? No, no, you don't do that. Nothing should be on the floor, right? Fumes, electrical shock, right? Um, I'm not so sure there should be electrical shock, but there is, right? You should have protective material there that is uh, the technology that is going to protect every one of those uh, outlets, right? 90% of injuries occur on the fingers and hands. I suppose that's kind of better news. Not that it should happen at all. All right, take a look at these images from a safety perspective. What is considered correct versus incorrect in this image, right? And you see this excited young student, right? Uh, dealing with a chemical, it's fizzing gases going off. They're dealing with beakers and flasks and this, that, and whatever. Uh, the important thing here is liquid hazards. Look what the student has on the eyes. Safety glasses. Useless! Believe it or not, look over the top, just like my prescription glasses. Look over the top. It's all open here on the side, all right? Very unsafe, believe it or not. Very unsafe. You need to have indirectly vented chemical splash goggles. Again, indirectly vented chemical splash goggles. Not prescription glasses, not safety glasses, right? So that's one of the biggest issues. Another issue I would say is they probably should have on uh, nitrile or vinyl gloves um, and an apron wouldn't hurt either. Okay. Okay, what's the deal here? What's considered correct or incorrect, all right? Well, here we go again. And these are older students who should know better after years and years of safety training. Look what they have on their eyes. This is just craziness, all right? Safety glasses, useless. 
all right? You need indirectly vented chemical splash goggles, all right? <clears throat> That's the standard that needs to be followed. That's a legal safety standard under OSHA PPE, personal protective equipment. It's also better professional safety practice under NSTA and others, and also uh, other companies that provide safety. So uh, very, very important. Um, I would also urge, again, um, have covering on the hands. They don't have gloves. They got nice lab coats. Next. Take a look at this image. All right, same deal. And I know you're going to get this one right away because we talked about it earlier. Um, nice part is indirectly vent chemical splash goggles. Could use gloves. Again, uh, could use aprons and the like in case any of that stuff splashes on them. But the young lady, again, hair hanging down, not safe, all right? Very unsafe. Make sure your students, or if you're an administrator, make sure you're gluing, you observe the teachers, make sure the kids' hair are pulled back. Very important. Next. <clears throat> what the data tells us. Okay, safer engineering and CTE instruction. Gee, that sounds like a familiar research project. Oh, wait a minute. It's <laughs> one that, oh, there's my name in the lower right hand corner. See, I'm not fibbing, guys. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a truth, I'm a truth guy. Okay, what's the data tells us? Data analysis from a study completed in 2020 investigating safety in STEM and CTE labs. Key findings. All right, now some of these are gonna be shockers. Now, this is what we found. Now we had approximately a thousand people involved nationwide in this study, right? So, and it's probably one of, this was long overdue, 10, 15, 20 years was when the last ones were done. It was just crazy. Anyway, 80% of science and STEM teachers, 80% reported having one injury in the past year, 80%? had at least one injury? Are you kidding me? Labs are more unsafe than people would believe. You know, I always end in my expert witness work, when I write to the jury, I say, and you think you're sending your kid to a safe place. I would just have to show them that statistic. It's just crazy, All right? 51% of the schools nationally have had an injury or a litigation, over half. 35% of the teachers of STEM and CTE did not have any formalized safety training. Well, listen, that is really encouraging. <laughs> really encouraging. 35%, over a third of them had no safety training and they're in there with our kids. <clears throat> Completing formalized safety training can reduce accidents by 51%. Here you go, here you go. Safety training, can reduce accidents by 50, doesn't eliminate them, remember, you can't make it safe, but it obviously really makes it a lot safer. 77% of accidents involve students. Well, that means that uh, the balance are the teachers. 62% hmm. of the teachers regard students not following instructions as the leading cause of accident injury. Very interesting. 62%, that's huge. 69% of the teachers do not use safety acknowledgement form. All right, you know what? One well, of the easiest ways to cover your butt if you're getting sued is if you use safety acknowledgement forms because these forms have to be signed by the, the students and the parents. And it tells what the safety protocols are that the students are responsible to follow. I'm not gonna say it leaves you off the hook, from lawsuits, but it certainly does help your case. Only 45% of schools have ANSI ISEA Z87.1 D3 2020 indirectly vented chemical splash goggles. All right, some of these teachers, they wanna save money for the school districts, God bless them. Unfortunately, they go to the dollar, excuse me, since the inflation, I should say the dollar 25 stores. <clears throat> you go to the dollar 25 stores and they buy safety glasses. Or I've even seen goggles. Trust me, these are not ANSI ISEA Z87.1 D3. Doesn't meet the standard. All right, this is cheap crap out of China. I hate to say that, but it's true. It's true. All right. What happens if something hits it? It's going to shatter. 
Well, where are those pieces going to go? Let's see. The projectiles come in this way. It's inward. Oh, you'll have one less eye to see with. Well, you only have two. And if it's a really big smash, you're done. Next. Oh, good. My turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought it would never happen. No, you you've done a great job so far, Ken. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> well, not to make this into an infomercial, but here at Science Safety, we have really done our best to architect a holistic approach. And by that, I mean we try to integrate a strategic approach to your school safety program that starts with that individualized, personalized, appropriate safety training that's made for each grade level and subject area. The use of those digital student safety contracts or safety acknowledgement forms that Dr. Ken just mentioned. Uh, a virtual inspection assistant for your annual safety inspections, chemical inventory management, and a whole lot more. We review safety manuals, chemical hygiene plans, existing training systems, and truly, we collaborate with schools and districts to enhance safety and facilitate increased safety awareness for all stakeholders in your school ecosystem. And we do that based on this wonderful framework right here, where you can see that it's, a, it's a, like a Mobius strip, and this repeats every school year with training and awareness, program and documentation reviews contracts and acknowledgement forms, activity-based risk assessments, which is exactly what this was about tonight, personal protection or personal protective equipment, materials, inventory, and safety data sheets. You must have an SDS for every chemical that is found in your school. Facilities and lab inspections, critically important. And then of course, safe and secure material storage. That is the foundation that science safety has been built on. And we do that through all of those different pieces that we talked about. Uh, and Dr. Ken is heavily involved in making all of that happen, making sure it's all up to legal standards and better professional safety practices. Is that right, Dr. Ken? Right on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and again, these are the, the current areas where we have been uh, focused on because this is these are the areas that school districts and individual schools are typically having uh, the biggest deficits. So virtual training, that's our, our on-demand training. We can do that. We can have an online service, anything that you want. And it is specific for science and STEM teachers, also for students. Administrators, it's very important that administrators are properly trained in what to recognize as well. CTE teachers need very specialized training. And mainstream teachers actually need their annual compliance training. It's, it's not good enough anymore to watch a five minute video on a HASCOM standard and accept that as your annual safety training. It's so much more rigorous. Safety inspections. When was the last time you actually conducted or were part of a safety inspection in your science department? Great question to ask. Do you use those safety acknowledgement forms? How are they managed? As Dr. Ken mentioned just three minutes ago, critically important for reducing liability and exposure. It's a great, great mechanism. It also reinforces the culture of safety awareness in your schools. And inventory management, knowing what you actually have on site is very, very important, not only for yourself, but in case of a fire, a flood, a break-in for emergency services as well. And making sure that they're all GHS compliant is another layer, another dimension to that. Now, again, everything we've talked about here is all about raising that level of safety awareness. And there's truly a hundred other aspects or approaches that we could discuss to really bring that all together here. But we really want to ensure that administrators, educators, and students are included as a part of that entire collaboration, <coughs> holistic risk management approach that prevents accidents and injuries in all of your schools. 
So that's the infomercial part of, of the program tonight. Uh, I just want to say that I have enjoyed learning so much from you again, Dr. Ken. It is a privilege and an honor to hear you speak about these things. And I think it's time to open this up now for the interactive part because we want to stay on time and be very mindful of people's uh, time. There's a few questions already in the chat box. Uh, are, are you ready to answer some questions, Dr. Roy? I'm on it, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Ken, what do you do when you find chemicals with no labels on them? I found a box filled with older chemicals and no idea what these are. That's a beautiful question. Well, the results may not be so beautiful. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Uh, Very realistic. Un unfortunately, but... I remember if you recall earlier in the program, I mentioned that teachers, science teachers especially, um, tend to be hoarders. <laughs> Uh, yeah. One of the biggest problems I find is when the teachers reach retirement time um, and you have the new teacher just out of university coming in and they're going through their new lab, they're all excited and they go to that cabinet in back of the lab, they open it up and they find all of these chemicals piled in there, half the labels you can't read, some of them have degraded. They've fallen off. You don't know what label goes on where. Uh, the, at the tops of the bottles, they're oozing out or they have crystal formations. Um, if you get anything like that, just gently close the door and um, you should have the supervisor contact the uh, local fire marshal. And you have the fire people come in to take a look. Um, do not move chemicals. You may have something in there called peroxides. Peroxides are extremely dangerous. We had a biology teacher about 15, 20 years ago, I believe it was in Maryland, was using one of these peroxide, picric acid as a stain, found an old bottle of it, a very large bottle, crystals galore. If you're a space science teacher, you might get excited about the crystals. But anyways, <clears throat> puts his hand, one hand on the bottle, the other hand on the cap, vibrates it, opens it, it explodes from his elbow down, the arm was blown off. National recall, all right? A decade or more, this happened. To this day, I still find bottles of picric acid hoarded away in cabinets, in chemistry labs, especially in high schools. This is very dangerous stuff, all right? So again, to go back to your original question, if things look fairly orderly, you can read all the labels and they also, by the way, have dates on them, which you need to do with your inventory. And you don't see anything that's potentially outdated. And again, remember some chemicals, once you open them up, the clock is ticking, especially with peroxides, but there are others, right? So you want to be very careful. If it looks like a clean, it was taken care of and it's something you can handle, most certainly go ahead and do it. But if you have any, any concern about some of the things that I've mentioned, gently close it and go get help. Get somebody that knows how to deal with it. And then also may have to call OSHA in, all right? If, if you're under federal OSHA in a private school or a public school, you might be under a state plan uh, Department of Labor, whatever, but get the help. Do not handle it yourself, all right? Because it can be extremely dangerous. Hopefully and if you're for fortunate enough to have a chemical hygiene officer in your area, ask that person and they can provide that guidance for you as well. Okay, let me just add a little caveat to that. <laughs> okay, fair not enough. Unfortunately, some school districts do not have qualified chemical hygiene officers. I have seen business managers serving as chemical hygiene officers because the teachers refuse to do it, right? I've seen superintendents acting and they were not science people. So it's a good, good idea, but you just make sure that the, the chemical hygiene officer has the background, they know what they're dealing with, um, Knows that they were a chem teacher. That's the bottom line. 
Yeah, but, qualification. But it's, a, it's a very good point. Right, qualification right. is critically yeah. important yeah. for sure. Yeah. Ken, I, I've answered this question on the chat box, but I just want you to validate it for me. Question is, is there a minimum square footage allowance per student in the lab? Occupancy load, your favorite topic. Uh, this is, you just took the words out of my mouth. This is one of my favorite <laughs> questions, right? Because I personally almost got my fanny fired on uh, the first year <laughs> as a director in a school district because I found out that we far surpassed the occupancy load. Now, this is not an OSHA deal. This is the fire code, NFPA deal. Most states have adopted it. Now, even if they didn't adopt it, under better professional practice, it is a requirement. And the courts see both of those as legal safety standards are equal to better professional practices. So even if you're not under legally, you are under better professional safety practice. 50 square feet per occupant net. You take the square footage of the lab and you subtract out all the furniture, all the counters, et cetera, et cetera, because it's net. Then you divide by 50, and that tells you how many occupants. Now, again, this is not class size. This is total occupants. This is teacher, special ed teacher in there. Um, if you have special ed paras, if you have volunteers in there, if you have parents in there, they all count. <clears throat> so it behoove you to make sure that you know the occupancy load, because remember, legally, it is the science teacher who's responsible for safety in the lab, not the administrator. Let me rephrase that again, repeat it. It's the teacher who's in charge of safety. Though administrators think they are legally in the courts, it's really the teacher because who's the one that goes to college and takes all these courses in science and is trained in chemistry and physics and biology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's a teacher and the courts know that, right? So most certainly yeah, that's that's the way that goes. Great, you have time for a few more questions? For you, certainly. Oh, that makes me feel good. Don't feel too good. It says, Ken, if I did a hazard analysis and assessment, and a student is injured, am I still held responsible? Most certainly. However, you have an outstanding defense. You were proactive. In other words, you can be sued and you'll be in court, but you illustrate, for example, you have them fill out a safety acknowledgement form. You're gonna use that. That can be subpoenaed in the courtroom. In your lesson plans, always, before your lab, if you hadn't, you're going to do a particular lab, say you review the appropriate safety procedures and make sure you do that. You just don't do it once at the beginning of the year. It must continuously be on the radar, right? So uh, by doing the hazard analysis, risk assessment, et cetera, et cetera, all these things are in your corner in a lawsuit. Again, it doesn't mean you can't be sued, but you're going to have an excellent, excellent case. And remember, the courts do understand they can't make it totally safe. You can only make it safer. And you made it safer by doing these things, but accidents happen. Exactly. Actually, let's let's stick with it, that area. Uh, it says, Dr. Roy, I buy mostly pre-made kits from suppliers. I thought their instructions were already safety approved. Is that correct? Well, <laughs> I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> It depends what your perception is on safety approved. <laughs> um, I have found time and time again, now there are some, very, I won't mention what they are, but there are reputable companies, I believe in earnest, have someone knowledgeable that's doing that work. But many others, especially the ones from abroad, um, not in this country, but from other countries, uh, not so much. And uh, that, that's a good one for your, if it's with chemicals and things, have your chemical hygiene officer look it over. Uh, if you have uh, someone on staff that's been there a number of years, experience, and has done these things before, check with them. Do not assume just because they say, oh yes, it's safe, you know, safe. Things. I mean, I've seen some horror shows in these little kits and they say, oh, not, nothing to worry. Everything is fine. Everything is safe. Uh, we, we had it tested, this and that it was bogus, right? 
So, I mean, I hate to tell you that bad news, but, but that is it. And I'm not saying you shouldn't use the kits, but again, redo your own hazard analysis, risk assessment, and take the appropriate safety action with that kit. Very good. Here's, I'll give you one more question. How's that? Because I want to be respectful of your time as well. We need new goggles, but our principal says there's not enough money in our budget. Oh. Is there a legal, yeah, you and I hear this all the time. Is there a legal regulation we can use to show her that we need $240 to buy a new class set of chemical goggles? You share, if you're an OSHA state, you share the personal protective equipment standard, all right? And that covers you. Not Remember, OSHA doesn't give a rat's, well, whatever to do, uh, about the students. They're concerned about you. So that's number one. You give a copy of the PPE standard that they're required by law as the employer to provide you with your eye protection. The students, make sure most states have a goggle statute statute that's heavy duty law okay and it says very clearly in there you also know that that's the legal stuff you're going to do then what you're going to do better professional safety practice you're going to go to the nsta website and you check on their safety papers there by the safety advisory board it's written right in there it tells about all the types of things they need to have look on my safety blog all right, my safety blog, I have several safety blogs that were written specifically to help teachers to defend them, to make sure that when they're dealing with administrators that the teacher knows the one that needs glasses or goggles or not, not the administrator, all right? Uh, the American Chemical Society, another good resource for this. And there's a lot of stuff out there, both legal safety standards, better professional practice, and yes, bottom line, always put everything in writing. This is a very serious situation you're dealing with. <clears throat> and let me tell you one other thing. You have every right to tell that administrator, unless it knows if you feel that you have faulty eye protection, faulty PPE or insufficient numbers, all right? You have every right to tell the administrator, sorry, we are stopped doing labs until you provide us with what we are required to have by law and better professional safety practice, all right? I would also cover your butt, put, always put it in writing. I would also go to your union, let your union rep know about it. Now, if things get a little testy and they start pressuring you uh, doing things, I would have the union go to OSHA, all right? Um, just unacceptable. They should be ashamed of themselves for putting you even in that situation, all right? that money to cost to buy those is going to be relatively cheap instead of the million dollar lawsuit multi-million dollar lawsuit that could happen if some kid is injured in their eyes or whatever or even you are injured right so no you don't take that what they're telling you sorry i think i've given you enough resources that you can make them aware of it and just you know what raise their level of awareness and tell them to get with the program I love that answer. <laughs> just, just assertive enough. I love it. <laughs> well, it's true. The teacher, it is. this administrator is putting this teacher and those students in dramatic safety. Right. The, the, there's no difference if your eyewash station is non functional, then you cannot do a lab involving Ab chemicals in that room. Your engineering controls, and if you don't have the appropriate ventilation, right. right? If you do not have shower, if you do not have eyewash, uh, you have electrical issues no sorry we're not doing the left and oh by the way you might want to let the guidance department know because um the universities and colleges usually require uh one two or more years of laboratory science and they have to attest to that fact if you're not doing activities they you don't have laboratory science that must be something administrator might want to know <laughs> well said very well said. Well, Dr. Ken, on behalf of all of us here at Science Safety and everyone here in attendance, I wanna thank you for your uh, generosity, for your insights, and for sharing all of your knowledge regarding uh, hazard analysis, risk assessments, and then of course, safety actions tonight. It has been my pleasure to uh, be your moderator and facilitate this with you. And 
Thanks for the, the few minutes at the end of this. Uh, that was wonderful to do the infomercial. And for all of you still, uh, still with us here, tomorrow you'll receive an email from Science Safety and we will include uh, the banned chemical listing that many of you have asked for in the chat box. We'll be happy to send that out to you. And of course, there's the reasons why you don't use a chemical like hexamethyl death because it's educational, uh, the risk exceeds its educational value. And it's quite an extensive list. Again, it's a typical list. Uh, follow your state and local uh, guidance on that uh, because most school districts uh, and jurisdictions do have some type of a banned listing right. now, which is very good to see. And we will also be providing some other um, safety resources for you as well. So again, thank you so much for attending. We want to be mindful of everyone's time. We're coming up on the hour right here. My name is James Palsik, and thank you so much, Dr. Ken Roy. And thanks to everyone else for sharing part of their evening with us again in this important. Go get the word out there, and again, help protect your colleagues and your students. Administrators don't always know what they're doing, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Dr. Ken. Later. All You're right. Safer. Bye -bye. Very good. Bye-bye.